A very important dimension of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals is the insertion of technology, and in particular artificial intelligence, to help us with the, the many different facets and complexities of climate. Uh, it, as Daryl said, the predictive analytics that come to us uh, in the context of artificial intelligence and beginning to do long-term prediction on the state of uh, climate, state of desertification, sea level rise, the, the fire years now instead of fire seasons, uh, the likelihood of category six hurricanes coming as sea level temperatures continue or sea surface temperatures continue to rise. All of this is an enormously complex matter and in many respects, only artificial intelligence can help us to see uh, these realities as we go forward. Global growth is slowing, and many policymakers hope that artificial intelligence, or AI, will provide a magic solution. Many countries are now developing plans and funding research in artificial intelligence. The EU, Brazil, and other Western countries have adopted regulations that grant users greater control over their data and require that firms using AI be transparent about how they use it. How is the US responding to the challenges of these new technologies and to this new competition? General John Allen and Dr. Daryl West are here with us for this Great Decisions at World Boston program on AI and data. They are the authors of the recently published book, Turning Point, Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence, which discusses both the opportunities and risks posed by artificial intelligence. And I'm Mary Eintema, the president of World Boston. As you may know, the mission of World Boston is to foster engagement in international affairs and global cooperation. Even though we're at home, maybe even especially while we're at home, we strongly believe that while our programs may change, this mission must persist. I hope you'll learn more about World Boston at worldboston.org. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers. Uh, General John R. Allen is president of the Brookings Institution. He's a retired U.S. Marine Corps four-star general and former commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He is co-author of Hyperwar, Conflict and Competition in the AI Century. Daryl M. West is vice president and director of governance studies at the Brookings Institution and holds the Douglas Dillon Chair. He's the director of the Center for Technology Innovation at Brookings and is editor-in-chief of its Tech Tank blog. He is the author of The Future of Work, Robots, AI, and Automation, among other books. So let's jump in. Uh, Daryl, I think uh, you had a couple of things to get us started with. Okay, uh, thank you, Mary. First of all, it's great to be with you. We appreciate you hosting uh, this event. I have uh, fond memories of Boston from my uh, 26 years teaching at Brown University. So although I lived in uh, Providence, I spent a lot of time in uh, Boston. And of course, I still follow the uh, New England Patriots. So I miss Tom Brady, but I've become a quick fan of Cam Newton. So John and I wrote this book because we think AI is one of the transformative technologies of our time. It's being deployed in sectors from healthcare and education to transportation, e-commerce, and national defense. In the book, we present in-depth case studies of AI in each of those areas, looking at both how it's being used as well as the opportunities and risks that are being posed. We wrote the book for a general audience to try and explain the technical issues of AI to journalists, policymakers, and laypeople. We also take a deep dive into AI and national defense and the geopolitical aspects in terms of the US relation with China, Russia, and Europe. So I think one of the strengths of the book is that it combines US domestic and international AI applications. The title is Turning Point because we argue we are at a major inflection point between utopia and dystopia. And the crucial variable in determining that future is public policy. So in the book, and we'll get into this more in the uh, conversation tonight, we'll present a detailed policy and governance blueprint. If we take appropriate actions, we're very confident about the future. But if we don't take the right actions, things can go uh, uh, off the rails uh, pretty uh, quickly. 
And I'll close with one uh, last uh, comment. It's important that we get this right because a Price Waterhouse Coopers report estimated that AI is going to increase global GDP by 15.7 trillion by 2030. But the interesting part was their regional breakdown of where that money is going to go. The report estimated that 7 trillion is going to go to China, 3.7 trillion will go to the US and Canada, 1.8 trillion will go to Europe, and the remainder will be spread around the world. So the economic stakes are high, the security stakes are high, and the ramifications for competitiveness is very high. Let me come in behind Daryl uh, just to make a couple of quick comments and then we can get into the questions. Yep, great. Uh, often in conversations like this, uh, we go to immediately the application of, uh, of the technical dimension of AI. And the point about the book is not about the code, it's not even about the algorithm or the data set or even the supercomputing that gives it its apparent capacity to make decisions. It's about the policy framework. Because in the end, this technology is neutral. And depending how it is governed, will ultimately determine whether it is, as Daryl said at the beginning of his comments, rendering us in a world that is uh, a world of dystopia or a world of utopia. And we'll never hit either of the extremes. Uh, but those states who positively seek a policy framework within which the technology of artificial intelligence and its associated family of capabilities can serve the greater good of the society with respect to privacy and safety and so on. And we'll talk about all this. That's really the issue of the turning point uh, because left to itself, AI is neutral, but inside the right kind of policy framework, it can do enormous good or can serve uh, a, a nefarious interest very easily. And let's make one comment. I'd like to read the, the dedication uh, in our book. And it says that this book is dedicated to our youth to whose hands we've placed the full potential of AI and other emerging technologies. It is our most fervent prayer that they are guided by the light of good in wielding these technologies for the benefit of all humanity. So this is really the key point here. And we can, we can get this right or we can get this wrong. And if it goes wrong, it can be wrong in a very big way. But it won't be because the technology went wrong by itself. It'll be because the framework that technology emerged and became more uh, sophisticated and, and it, that framework permitted it to happen. And one other point I'll make <clears throat> is Daryl and I worked on a glossary uh, It's in the back of the book. And it's uh, one of the things that we found and I think many people find when they talk about AI, it's a bit bewildering, so many terms, so many different uh, uh, dimensions to it. It's it's the old adage of the elephant. You know, you touch that elephant in a different place and it seems to be something different. Uh, so we put a, a glossary in the back and we'll update that. It's a living document. And as the sophistication goes forward, we'll update that as well. Cool. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to point out, since we're all on our screens right now, um, the, the book is behind Daryl, uh, but uh, there's a link to it um, so you can uh, pick it up yourself if you haven't already done so. Shop local, you can uh, get it at the Harvard Bookstore. Uh, so, oh, there it is, okay. Uh, how, how shocking that the author has it right there. Um, so um, thank you, General, for your uh, uh, clarification that it's, it's not really about the technology. This is, um, our, our task is to think about the policy. Um, and in a way that, um, ordinary people can understand because um, we, we <laughs> were the ones who were affected um, and that we're at a turning point. Um, so I'm wondering why this time is so crucial, why this is a turning point. But before we even get there, um, let's take an ordinary person moment. That would be me. What is AI? What do we mean today when we, when we say AI? Well, our opening chapter is entitled, What is AI? Because, okay. <laughs> Mary, you are not alone. Uh, right. I've given lots of talks on AI, and you know, people see the Hollywood image of the Terminator and think uh, AI is uh, intelligent robots that are going to enslave humanity. Uh, 
in our book, we have a very specific definition of AI is automated software that learns from data, text, or images, and then makes intelligent and autonomous decisions based on that. And we emphasize that because the key concepts are intelligence, learning, and adaptability. And that's what really distinguishes AI from you know, traditional software or other uh, uh, types of uh, equipment. And it's being deployed in a lot of areas. Uh, when people apply for loans uh, today, financial institutions are using AI to determine your credit worthiness. Uh, when you go on Amazon, uh, you know, you'll notice little boxes pop up. Uh, you might be interested in these products. That's AI where they've looked at what you've purchased, what you've looked at and not purchased. And they claim a third of their sales now are coming from their AI-based product recommendations. Autonomous vehicles use AI to power them. So AI is really popping up in a lot of different respects, but it's the learning capability, the autonomy, and the adaptability that really distinguishes it. Okay. To Daryl's uh, definition, uh, the reason that AI is becoming uh, so pervasive and is, is becoming more powerful is because of three things. And that is not just the, the arithmetic algorithm itself that will ultimately foster the decision, but two other major developments in, in the last couple of decades have given us the capacity to really leverage AI. And that is the availability of masses of data. Here the, the adage that's uh, frequently thrown out these days that 90% of the world's data of in, in our entire history was created in the last two years. Well, I keep hearing that, but it's probably fair to say that the majority of information throughout human history has in fact been uh, rendered into data in the last uh, several years. So availability of data is enormously important both for the, to train the AI algorithm, but ultimately to give it the capacity to make decisions. Very importantly, the power of computing has really come a very long way in the last couple of decades because artificial intelligence as a term with the theory of its capabilities has been in existence for decades. What was absent was the computing power necessary to, to give that algorithm the capacity to be trained on masses of data so it could make decisions. So there are really three essential components, the algorithm, the data, and the computing. And when those three are operating uh, synergistically, there you have the opportunity for, as Daryl said, autonomous decision-making. Great, thank you. Um, so that's, that's what what it is, um, and I guess that helps us understand uh, why uh, why we got to this pivot point. Um, so, what what is at stake? Why is this pivot point this time so crucial? I would argue it's a crucial time right now, just because, as John just pointed out, the capabilities have increased dramatically because of the improvements in computing storage and processing uh, power. The deployment is much more widespread. It's being literally used in every area uh, now, uh, particularly uh, uh, finance. There are a lot of applications in healthcare, in education, uh, in the COVID world in which we live. Uh, AI is uh, powering a lot of different applications. So there's a time of great opportunity now in the sense that AI can take over the repetitive, boring, or dangerous tasks and thereby free up humans for more creative and innovative activities. But then we also face all these problems in terms of fairness, bias, lack of transparency, the implications for human safety. Uh, we're kind of in an AI race with China now, so there's an international dimension as well. The question of who decides. So there's a lot of issues that are yet to be resolved. Most of these decisions for the last 30 years have been delegated to the private sector. The public increasingly is getting concerned about all these issues. So that's where our book comes in by talking about what are the policies needed to deal with these specific problems so that we can take advantage of the opportunities and not get enslaved by the problems that are developing. Okay, let's, um, I, I really wanna come back to that notion of, of who decides, but I'm wondering if we could take a minute to walk through the, the, the domains uh, or the, the areas that um, you go through in the book. So um, let's, let's talk about AI in, for example, education or AI in transportation. Um, 
what what are the opportunities and risks in in fields that we all we all experience every day Errol, you want to talk briefly about the uh you know we're in eye deep in a, in a global lethal pandemic the united states passed 200,000 dead today we're approaching one million uh, infected uh, yes uh definitely about how ai has participated in this process Yep, uh, we're seeing applications in healthcare uh, related to COVID. There certainly are lots of education examples. There are many uh, examples in transportation as well. So in the uh, COVID uh, area, AI is actually helping scientists come up with new drug uh, therapies to treat the uh, pandemic, as well as to come up with a vaccine. Uh, because in each of those areas, you essentially are looking for new compounds or new uh, chemical combinations that would be effective in treating the disease. And so some of that involves looking into scientific uh, literature and trying to figure out uh, what works. It turns out AI is actually really good at reading the literature, uh, can do so faster, more efficiently than humans. So uh, that's one way in which it's uh, being uh, very helpful. In the education area, a lot of schools are now deploying AI algorithms for uh, student assignment uh, issues. So, you know, if you're applying to charter schools and there are, you know, 10 different charter schools in uh, Boston, an algorithm may actually now make the decision in terms of which particular school uh, you attend. And it's important because, especially in the education area, you know, issues of equity, fairness, and bias and discrimination are just so important in determining people's futures. So we want the algorithms to make wise decisions. And of course, that involves the human element. Uh, and the challenge of AI is, you know, we're all conflicted over basic values and getting the algorithm to make the right decisions that respect the human values that we care about. Okay. Uh, importantly, in terms of education, AI gives us capabilities to for learning that we probably could never have imagined before. Uh, the whole process of education shifts from the, the aspect of teaching to the aspect of learning. Uh, AI, for example, gives us the capacity to do nearly on-the-spot monitoring of student uh, um, capabilities, uh, what the learning that the students have gone through to assess the success of the students in the AI-supported curriculum. And when you combine that with uh, uh, ex extended distributed learning, which is what, frankly, we are all doing now. We were driven onto these platforms because of the, of the pandemic. But when you combine that with the uh, international capabilities uh, and augmented or virtual reality, uh, the capabilities are, are really uh, very uh, A challenge that we face today, and Daryl touched on it, and I think we'll come back to it, uh, which is the issue associated with AI and bias which right. can get it very wrong in terms of how we treat people with, uh, in the context of equality and equity and fair assignments, et cetera. The, the, the other challenge that we have today with respect to AI uh, in our educational system is broadband uh, availability. Um, we simply have to bring more of the country and in fact the world uh, into the environment of broadband access, uh, which gives access to the internet uh, and ultimately, with, with the advent of 5G, which are pipes, if you will, that gives us enormous capacity to move information and uh, complex data sets, uh, the, the whole learning process is, uh, I think, vastly improved. Uh, but large segments of the American population have no real access to this future uh, because of limited broadband. And so part of the policy process associated with artificial intelligence and the educational process is to uh, create the platform which gives the entire uh, aspect of our of our youth the entire sweep of our youth uh, equal opportunity for the kind of ai supported learning uh, that those primarily in urban centers and primarily on the coasts will enjoy so much of rural america doesn't enjoy broadband access and will not have access to 5g for some period of time and large segments of our most vulnerable populations uh, are populations of color. Uh, they also find themselves in positions where they don't have the kinds of broadband access that can give them the capacity to both participate in and benefit from and give us as a people the opportunity to harvest the enormous social and human potential of these youngsters. This is really an opportunity for us that we have to put serious work on. 
Okay, great. Um, so we, we've touched on education and health. Um, obviously, um, General Allen, <laughs> a, a topic that we have to discuss is national security um, and uh, the impact of these, these exploding capabilities on uh, defense and, and, and our national security more broadly. Um, what, what have we gained? What, what are we at risk of losing? It's an enormously important subject. It's quite complex. Uh, let me, before we talk about AI itself, let me just talk a, a little bit about a couple of uh, issues associated with competition. Okay. Uh, war throughout all of history has been a time competitive process. And in many occasions, whether it's in battle or in campaigns or in wars itself, uh, that side which was able to decide and act more quickly in an absolute sense or even a relative sense with respect to the opponent was often the side that could prevail. Uh, and so the speed of action uh, in warfare is a, a critical capability. And what we find is that over our recent history, the history of the last two centuries, uh, but in particular in the 20th century, where uh, visionaries who truly understood the implications of technology, but were steeped in the profession of arms, could see that emerging technologies, when properly integrated with each other and uh, properly deployed with the right kinds of doctrinal tenets, could achieve enormous capabilities far beyond the individual components. And, and the example that I often use is the example of the Blitzkrieg uh, in the late 30s and early 40s where wireless radio, fast moving armored vehicles supported by a very accurate air support from the German Stuka bombers, the capacity to put those three things together gave the Germans the capacity to move at speed so fast that the British and the French simply couldn't keep up, not necessarily with the specific armaments, they were defeated intellectually in many cases, because of the speed of action and the speed of movement. Artificial intelligence has the potential of bringing that uh, into an entirely new realm of consideration in the 21st century. And I've written extensively on the subject of hyperwar, which is about warfare operating at speeds that vastly exceed those capabilities that we've seen before. The speed for the collection of information the speed for the analysis of information to produce usable, actionable intelligence, the capacity for command and control systems to be artificially intelligent to provide decision support to commanders and decision assistance to commanders so that we're gathering the information much more quickly, we're synthesizing it, we're providing actionable intelligence to another system that has the capacity of providing commanders very quickly decisions that can be made that put them ahead of our opponents in time. I haven't even talked about a weapon system, mm -hmm. but there are weapon systems now that are being considered, uh, which will be artificially intelligent and have capabilities. And here is the ethical issue that we ultimately are uh, facing uh, as Americans and as uh, a nation that is part of the community of democracies. We stand for something. We believe we stand for humanity. We stand for human rights. We stand for the rule of law. Uh, we stand for protecting the innocents and not taking life unnecessarily or, or creating destruction unnecessarily. That's, that's inherent in who we are. But our opponents are not necessarily similarly imbued with the same principles and ethics. And where we are seeking to master the employment of artificial intelligence, and you'll hear the term lethal autonomous weapon system. Mm -hmm. A weapon system may be unleashed either on the ground or in the air into the battle space where theoretically it can do the target acquisition on its own, target identification on its own, target engagement on its own, and then ultimately determine whether it needs to re-engage again. We are not there as a people in terms of providing that release. So we have the dilemma about where the human is. We say, is the human in the loop? In other words, as the process is continuing inside the system, where does the human intervene to ensure we haven't taken the shot against a family in a home just to get one bad actor. Uh, is a human on the loop? In other words, the human is, is uh, watching the process unfold and only intervenes 
if necessary, as opposed to always being uh, in, in, intervening. But when the human intervenes, then we move potentially slower than our opponents. And in a time competitive process, being too slow uh, means you'll come in number two. Now that's just in, at a, uh, a philosophical systematic uh, level. The kinds of weapon systems we're seeing being developed today, the Russian S-70 high performance drone, uh, the Hunter is a real issue. Uh, and we have to be very conscious of the, the fact that the Russians and probably the Chinese are moving forward with building highly sophisticated uh, air systems, uh, what they call un unmanned combat aerial vehicles, UCAVs, which have the capa capacity both to engage in the air and to engage on the ground. And the chances are very good. They're not, they're not held back by issues associated uh, with uh, the human in the loop or the human on the loop. And then finally, uh, this is a real game changer and we're, we're coming to grips with it now. And that is the whole advent of systems. Uh, missile systems that are artificially intelligent, and they're, on, they're not only artificially intelligent and potential, uh, potentially capable of autonomous action, artificially intelligent, capable of autonomous action, and supporting other systems that are in the air at the same time. And we're talking about systems that are flying somewhere around 4,000 miles an hour in excess of Mach 5, are very rapidly in a, in a uh, combat environment where the kinds of systems are in the air and other smaller systems are in the air to include color driven quadcopters and hypersonic systems in the same battle space. You can imagine that very quickly the humans can be uh, overwhelmed uh, very quickly by the, it, the enormity of what they have to both sense and react to. And the reality will be probably that battle management systems that are artificially intelligent will have to play a very important role in this as we go forward. Hyperwar is about the speed of conflict picking up at a level, at the strategic level, at the campaign and operational level, and at the tactical level in ways we've not seen before. Not only is it about the emergence of this technology and the integration of this technology, or innovations that are, are, are built wholly for the purpose of advancing the technology. So uh, AI in, battle, in, uh, in warfare is either an integrative process with legacy systems, or an innovative process that builds it from the ground up to be a new generation. Uh, those are coming, it's just coming. The question is, is the human up to the standard to be able to operate intellectually, operate spiritually and morally in an environment where the, the, uh, the environment is evolving so quickly around them as to be very rapidly overwhelmed. So not only is it about the technology, we're gonna have to think about how we select train and educate the young women and men who will be commanding forces that will be operating in a hyper warfare environment. Thank you. Uh, well, so that actually sets up um, probably what will be my, um, my winding up question for this section. Both of you have, um, you know, sort of given us uh, a sense of, of the landscape. Um, what it sounds like is that um, we've, we've gotten this far um, almost organically, right? Um, leaving it, uh, uh, at least initially, largely to the private sector, um, but now is the time to make policy. Uh, so um, you do have a set of, of policy recommendations um, in, in much too short a time. I'm wondering if you can uh, let us know what the major takeaways um, in terms of policy making are. And then I'd like the follow on question is, what happens if we don't? What if we continue to just kind of let things go along, um, which we could? Well, Mary, those are great questions. And we have a lot of policy recommendations in okay. the book. I'll just hit on a, a few hit. for you. Uh, we do believe that the important issue is keeping humans in control of the technology. I mean, John is absolutely right there, both on the domestic side as well as international military and defense applications. So a lot of our policy recommendations are geared to making sure that human values are respected and that humans are in charge of the, uh, the way that the technology is deployed. So for example, one idea we present in the uh, book is what we call AI impact statements. 
that are modeled after the environmental impact statements from 50 years ago. Uh, you mm -hmm. may recall that then for large scale projects that were publicly funded, there was a requirement to do an environmental impact statement of what impact would this development have on the environment? How would you mitigate any uh, possible negative consequences? We feel that that could be a good policy recommendation in terms of publicly funded large scale AI applications. Just having people think proactively about what the possible consequences will be, what the societal ramifications are, what the ethical issues are, and to figure out how to mitigate those problems before the issue is designed and uh, the product is uh, deployed. Uh, bias is a big problem, so developing appropriate anti-bias uh, rules for the digital world. Uh, we believe Congress needs much better advice on technology. Ironically, in 1995, Congress had this agency called the Office of Technology Assessment. Uh, in an interest in downsizing government in 1995, Congress abolished that just as the internet was taking off and the whole digital era was unfolding. So for the last 25 years, we haven't had an agency devoted to technology assessment, doing research, thinking about the policy ramifications. Uh, Congress should bring that back. Uh, John pointed out the need to improve digital access to broadband. So it would cost about $40 billion to basically bring broadband access to most of the country. That is a small price to pay for the benefits that would come out of that, the fairness and the equity advantages. So uh, those are just a few uh, ideas that we uh, present, but it's important to really think about the policy dimension. A lot of AI books are purely focused on the technology. I think the strength of our book is looking at the technology, but then thinking about the policy format and the government uh, format that would allow us to take advantage of the strengths of AI. I'll just add just very briefly behind Daryl. If you if you look at the guidelines that came out of the White House, if you look at the guidelines that have been issued by uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the guidelines for AI in so many ways are about doing good. Uh, DOD's uh, guidelines on the employment of artificial intelligence in the ecosystem of the Department of Defense, and obviously it eventually gets down to uh, systems and weapons, is going to be responsible. Uh, it be equitable, it be traceable, it be reliable, and very importantly, as Daryl just said, it has it has to be governable. So for us, us the the United States, but also us in the context of the community of democracies, which in my mind has to start to come together in a very serious way as we go forward in this century. How AI is ultimately uh, embraced by societies how AI and the populations interact will be about values. It will be about values. Uh, it won't be about the algorithms. It won't be about the technology uh, associated with uh, extraction of data. And it won't be about the supercomputing because those leaps in technology will continue forward. How it ends up being employed, whether it's in warfare, the surveillance of populations, or in education is going to be in many ways shaped by the respective values of our societies. Okay, great. And then um, the question, the sort of follow-on question is like, what if, what if we don't? Another way of asking that would be, um, if, if we, um, our political selves, don't make this, these decisions, who, who will? So somebody Darryl, will. Yeah, Daryl, you just testified before Congress. Uh, could you talk a little about uh, uh, how Congress sees its ultimate responsibility. I mean, AI is now on the agenda for Congress. Uh, the House Budget Committee just had a hearing uh, where I uh, testified, and there are a number of uh, new bills uh, that have been uh, introduced. But it's crucial to get this right right now, just because if we don't, we're going to end up with irresponsible and unethical AI. Uh, in terms of the education setting, uh, AI algorithms that are unfair. Uh, in the healthcare area, the gap between the haves and the have-nots will grow wider. We already see major racial disparities in uh, COVID. Uh, when you think about the national defense applications that John was uh, talking about, 
the implications in terms of U.S. relations with Russia, U.S. relations with China could uh, prove uh, much more problematic. So there are a lot of very negative features that could come out if we don't get this right. And so it, we're trying to tell members of Congress and people in the administration, like, it's time to act uh, that you know, in the post World War II period, the international community came together and decided the rules of the road for military engagement and warfare. So for example, we said chemical weapons, we should not allow. And there were treaties that uh, basically uh, disallowed uh, the use of that, which by and large, with a few exceptions, Syria and Iraq being notable exceptions, but most of the world has respected that. We need to start the conversations today that will create rules of the road for the use of AI in wartime. Because otherwise, we're going to end up in some of these scenarios that John talked about of really bad uses of AI, AI that is outside human control. I mean, the list can go on. Very bad consequences for America in particular, but the world as a whole. And I would say that, as Daryl as Darryl said very clearly, uh, the Congress, I think, and the American people are running out of patience with the tech industry uh, establishing the standards of uh, a quality of life uh, by virtue of coders instead of by policy and law. Hmm. Running out of patience on that. Uh, and with respect to uh, the Chinese and the Russians, uh, our hope at Brookings is that we see, and I, we try not to use the term the West. Uh, we do use that term, no offense to Daryl. Uh, we, uh, we like to think in terms of the community of democracies now because the West was a term that uh, was a, an exclusive term, not an inclusive term, and it implied North America and Europe. As we go forward in this century, there are very uh, capable democracies with powerful economies and who are technologically advanced who embrace in East Asia the same values that we have, the, the value of human life, the role of women in society, freedom of the press, uh, the rule of law, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, India. We've got to think in the 21st century about the community of democracies, mm -hmm. establishing standards of behavior, because almost every one of those states who would be a member of the community of democracies is technologically advanced. Here is an opportunity to aggregate both our values and aggregate our technology for uh, an enormous good for humankind. But if necessary, we can also defend ourselves from those who would use these kinds of technologies uh, to, for oppressive purposes or simply uh, suppressive purposes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we can go to a question now. We have uh, Jim Kaufman, a World Boston board member. I'm happy to say, Jim, what's your question? Thanks, Mary. And uh, Dr. West, General Allen, thank you for your presentation and thanks for joining World Boston, much appreciated. Early on in your presentation, you mentioned uh, future GDP numbers with respect to uh, AI, uh, with China roughly uh, projected at twice the GDP number uh, of the US. I'm guessing that's because of state-sponsored uh, funding for AI in China. Um, can you give a sense of um, what the picture is in the US presently? Is there a divide between government spending and private sector spending? And are you prescribing a certain degree of added uh, government spending in this area? Well, China is investing enormous resources in AI. And just because of the size of their population, I mean, John pointed out data are the crucial feature of AI. And the more data you have, the more applications and the, the, the more you can uh, develop uh, those uh, applications. So China does have a lot of advantages over us. but. We still have an amazing technology uh, sector. Uh, our tech companies are still the envy of the world. But the problem that I see is much of our technology investment is coming from the private sector and not from the government. And the problem is the private sector is interested in making commercial products. That's what they do. That's how they uh, make money. So we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, that is their primary uh, goal. You know, we need to think about AI for the public good. Uh, there may be AI applications that don't make any money, but we need because they can help us address education issues, healthcare uh, issues, uh, and uh, so on. So what we need is a national data strategy and a national innovation strategy 
that prioritizes not just developing commercial products that uh, make a lot of money, but thinking about the broader products and services that improve humanity, address equity questions, reduce bias, the things that might not be the top priority or companies right now, but should be a high priority for our country. I, I can't give you like exact numbers, but the amount of money that the government uh, is allocating needs to go up pretty substantially. And, and the good news is over the last year, it actually is starting to go up, but uh, moving forward, we need to spend more. And, and let me make a point in behind this. Mr. Kaufman, your, your question is extraordinarily important. Uh, and as Daryl said, the Chinese are making enormous investments uh, in artificial intelligence, and it is an explicit uh, objective of the 19th Party Congress that China will surpass the United States in artificial intelligence uh, by a certain date. I think it's 2030 at this point. Um, no one state in the world right now is, is able to make the kind of investment in artificial intelligence at the state level and to create an integrated process for moving forward, as have the Chinese. This goes back to our issue about the community of democracies. It's in our interest to do what we can as a community of democracies to aggregate our technology so that we can uh, innovate at a level that we could never have done before, but also move that innovation into application more quickly. One of the great uh, advantages that the Chinese enjoy, not only because they have uh, enormously talented uh, coders, mathematicians, and engineers, is that the, the amount of time between the, the writing of the algorithm and the, and the taking it to scale and application uh, for the Chinese is a relatively very short period of time. And they are, as a, as a culture, willing to take far greater risk far earlier than, than we see in the West. We're going to have to think differently about this if we're going to be able to compete with them over the long term. Okay, so we have a few more questions and we'll, we'll try and get them in. Uh, next, we have uh, Irv Kempner also of World Boston. Irv, go right ahead. Um, it seems that every, every time we come out with a new innovation, the preoccupation tends to be on uh, mutually assured destruction. <laughs> what what I'd, I'd like to ask a question about uh, the qualitative aspect that Dr. West was talking about. One of the things that, that struck me during the coronavirus uh, crisis early on is how we lost about 20, 25% of our meat production because um, uh, an, an individual who was uh, decided to come to work sick because they couldn't stand not collecting a paycheck. So that obviously um, you know, had enormous impact on the total country. And I'm wondering, have we thought about applications, about manufacturing, food safety, things like that? Uh, being in, this, this happened to be in a, in a butchering, in a slaughterhouse, okay. how AI could be utilized for food safety. Yes, and again, that, uh, illustrates John's point that it's not about the technology, it's how we're using it, what values are reflected, and how it fits with our public policy purposes. And the example you gave illustrates that perfectly, uh, that, you know, in, uh, in terms of food safety, we were losing uh, meat production uh, capacity because the poor people who work there could not afford to skip a paycheck. And so they would come to work sick, they would spread it among their coworkers, and uh, production plants uh, went offline as a result. Th that example is multiplied across our society. And so in order to move towards a better future, we need to integrate the technology and the policy so that our social policy provides appropriate support and appropriate incentives. Uh, and there are all sorts of examples of social policy changes that we uh, need to make. But I, Irv, I think you're exactly right that the policy aspect is really crucial as we think about the future scenarios. Okay, so now we have a question from Roderick Brown. Go right ahead. Yes, uh, I'm in the e-commerce business and obviously we've had a great deal of growth due to COVID-19 uh, and very high consumer satisfaction. My concern is once COVID-19 uh, is dealt with through uh, vaccines and so on and so forth, people are still gonna be staying in their homes and uh, there's gonna be a great deal of social isolation. So I think one of the downsides of uh, artificial intelligence is, is that it's gonna make people, make it easier for people to not engage with their neighbors, 
and in their community. Just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. I mean, I think you're right that what COVID did was to accelerate trends that already were unfolding, but instead of unfolding over five years, they unfolded over five months. So basically people moved to online learning because schools were closed. You know, it's risky going to your doctor. So telemedicine uh, took off. Uh, your field, e-commerce, we have a chapter in our book on e-commerce is exploding. That will be a permanent change. Many retail, many bricks and mortar retail establishments have gone bankrupt. Uh, some may come back in, in some other form, many will not. So basically, when you add all that together and throw in uh, remote work, which also is probably here to stay as well, at least in uh, some form, it is a major structural change in our society, how we operate, how we deal with one another. And Roderick, I think you're right that we do need to think about the social ramifications, how we relate with one another, how we communicate. Is there gonna be an increase in isolation? I mean, Brookings has been on remote work for six months now. Yep. Uh, some of our employees uh, feel more isolated. So, you know, we're thinking about ways to keep people engaged, providing uh, resources for people. I think as a country, we have to think about all those issues because the COVID changes are probably not going to be temporary. Like, even if in a few months we have a vaccine, the numbers go down and things start to look better, these structural changes already have taken place are likely to continue and are likely to accelerate in the future. So we need to get a handle on what the societal consequences are going to be. Let me come in behind uh, Daryl on this because this is really important. First, uh, full disclosure, uh, Roderick Brown and I went to high school. Rod. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know you should play baseball tonight. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I'd be cringing in terror at the in the corner. Uh, and Rod's a great friend. <laughs> Mary, you, you've raised the issue a couple of times on you know, the goodness or the badness of the application of artificial intelligence. And in the e-commerce uh, area, as both Rod and uh, Daryl implied, e-commerce has enormous capacity for those of us who are hiding out because of, the, of COVID or as the economy begins to change and goes more towards an e-commerce uh, uh, bias, uh, it will be helpful, probably helpful. But the, virtually the same kinds of algorithms that cause uh, on your uh, Amazon Prime page to pop up X number of, of proposed uh, uh, purchases, or if you're on uh, uh, Apple Music and the genius function is, is proposing to you music that you might want to hear by virtue of analysis of the music you've purchased, that same kind of algorithmic micro-targeting using artificial intelligence is exactly the same process of infiltrating our social media by our opponents and our enemies. Russia is, I consider an enemy, is in fact uh, the mechanism, the same mechanism that they're using to penetrate through social media to create bias or to change opinions or to denigrate a potential elected representative or to create chaos and uh, uh, loss of confidence in our democratic processes. So this is, this is a process that can be great, uh, uh, render great good, or it's a process that can be quite uh, deleterious to our democracy and our way of life. Okay, thank you. Uh, so time is ticking by. Uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, World Boston member in the queue here. Um, speaking of biases and exploiting my position um, as a panelist here, I wanna point out that we have, ah, oh, Mary, I am so glad to see you as well. I was gonna say we have, uh, just by judging, we have at least half of our participants judging by names are women and all of our questioners until now, including uh, uh, now that Mary has come on, um, all of our questioners have been men. So um, let's keep that in mind as we think about bias in, in um, the, our future with AI. So. Either Mary or Ed, please go ahead with your question. Oh, wait, wait, I had a question too, but I'll see to Mary. <laughs> All right. Well, my question is, okay, let's say you get the Office of Technology Assessment, probably under another name, reconstituted, and they make recommendations. How do you actually get that promulgated, especially if corporate America, places like uh, things like Facebook decide, oh, that's not going to be good for our bottom line. 
uh, they've got scads and scads of lobbyists, um, and they seem to go everywhere, sort of like, you know, the modern day equivalent of rats. You can't really quite get rid of them. Okay. Who, who decides? I mean, you know. Who decides? Mary, Mary, that is a great question. And the good news is we have a chapter in our book entitled Tech Lash, meaning the backlash against the technology sector. And what we argue basically is for the last 30 years, you're right, we've delegated all these decisions to the companies, but the world is changing now. Public opinion is changing. There's more critical assessment. Uh, Congress just had the hearing with the uh, CEOs of the four leading uh, tech uh, uh, internet uh, platforms. Uh, state and local government is actually moving into action. Uh, you know, they're outlawing the use of facial recognition by law enforcement. Uh, they're starting to regulate Airbnb uh, rentals. Uh, there are new rules for the gig economy in California. California also passed a privacy law. So we actually have the attention of policymakers. And I know just based on my own interactions with uh, members of Congress and people in the administration, they're, they actually are at the point they want to take action. They're just trying to figure out what is the right action? What is the action that will maintain innovation? Because we still need to continue to uh, innovate. But how do we address the known problems that already have uh, developed? So I'm actually less worried about you know, the lobbying uh, prowess, uh, you know, the, the money, because I think the public now is galvanized, uh, the policy community is uh, galvanized, and I think in the next one or two years, there's actually going to be action on a number of different fronts. Uh, we need a national privacy bill, we need to take cybersecurity more uh, uh, seriously, uh, we need investments in our critical infrastructure. Uh, my colleague John Villasenor just wrote a piece Zoom is now a critical infrastructure because a lot of schooling and education takes place through that platform. So uh, we need to invest and we need to make the policy choices that will protect us while still promoting innovation. Great. As Daryl has said, look, we, I think the American public is just about at the end of its patience uh, on this thing we, we have called digital authoritarianism, okay. which is the tech companies in fact are telling you what you should read, uh, what your values should be uh, with a reach that's that goes beyond well beyond our national borders. We have some tech companies with we, we call them digital citizens uh, and they they find that they have more uh, allegiance to the tech platform that they they communicate with every single day or offers them what to shop or what to read is their news, etc. than the national government that's one ridge line over that has no real effective reach to them. And so some of these uh, tech organizations, and I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of them, but some of these tech organizations uh, have, been, have grown to a take on uh, nearly a national identity in and of themselves. And we have to come to grips with that. And the only way to come to grips with that is about legislation and policy. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we'll have a quick final question from uh, Kate then to Mark. Hello. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us something about whether and how AI will have uh, usefulness as we try to manage the increasing climate change challenges Great. that are affecting our country and the world. Please. Okay. There are AI applications uh, for climate change, energy uh, management, and environmental uh, sustainability. Uh, and we believe that this is one of the primary areas where AI for the public good will be uh, illustrated because obviously climate change is accelerating, the wildfires are getting out of control, uh, extreme weather events are becoming more uh, frequent. And so AI can help us analyze what is happening. Uh, uh, scientists are using predictive analytics to try and project what's happening now and project it into the future and then figure out ways for us to uh, mitigate. Uh, there's a green building movement, uh, which is basically a new building construction, basically building them in a way that promotes sustainability. Uh, so there are a lot of promising uh, AI and data analytics applications in this area, and we need to accelerate the innovation in, in each of these areas. Very importantly, as Daryl just used the key word, sustainability. I'm surprised it took us this long in this uh, presentation to get to the issue of climate. 
which when people talk to me as a, as a military leader, they ask me, what is the greatest threat you think that the United States faces? And they want me to talk about North Korea or China or Russia or uh, some rogue nation. Uh, and I tell them the greatest threat the United States faces and in fact humanity faces is in fact the climate threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just uh, helped to chair an event last Sunday on sustainable development goals with the United Nations and a very important dimension of the 17 sustainable development goals is the insertion of technology and in particular artificial intelligence to help us with the, the many different facets and complexities of climate. Uh, it, as Daryl said, the predictive analytics that come to us uh, in the context of artificial intelligence and beginning to do long-term prediction on the state of uh, climate, state of desertification, sea level rise, the, the fire years now instead of fire seasons, uh, the likelihood of category six hurricanes coming as the sea level temperatures continue or sea surface temperatures continue to rise. All of this is an enormously complex matter and in many respects, only artificial intelligence can help us to see uh, these realities as we go forward. And let me make one final international relations comment. It may well be here where the United States uh, and the community of democracies working in close partnership technologically and scientifically with China to make a real dent in this matter. You know, we're all responsible for this. I think in many respects, the, the enormity of what we face on climate and the capacity that we have, both in terms of predictive analytics and the mitigation and management of climate effects, if we don't get our act together and see an opportunity here to cooperate and get past the constant confrontational rhetoric that is making this far more difficult and pushing off realistic climate solutions into the future beyond our means, beyond our ability to recover from it, we're going to be in serious trouble. Here is that chance with technology, artificial intelligence, the United States and the community of democracies in China, finding a way forward on the issue of climate. Okay. Well, uh, that uh, climatic note on climate, um, I think brings us actually to the end of our time. Uh, we still have more questions. Uh, Lord knows uh, this is a very rich topic. Um, so uh, let's all buy the book. And please join me in thanking uh, General John Allen and Dr. Daryl West for being with us tonight. And thank you all for joining us at World Boston's Great Decisions. <laughs>